Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. This is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. For more information or to help support our efforts, please visit us at www.batgap.com. Uh, my name is Rick Archer, and my guest today is Jim Drever. Jim is a native of New Zealand. Uh, he's a writer and teacher in the non-dual lineage, which says that sp the spiritual and material are one, and what is real is right here now. His own inner journey took 20 years, and then he finally awoke to the freedom that is his true nature, everyone's true nature. His mission now is to guide others to the same realization, but in a much shorter time. He currently teaches at Esalen Institute near Big Sur and in Los Angeles, New Zealand, and Australia. So welcome, Jim. Thank you, Rick. So how's it going in terms of helping people realize in a much shorter time? <laughs> it's happening. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh... It took me 20 years, as I say, and I feel that now I've, I've had one person wake up within like nine months mm -hmm. in session. So um, it's, uh, and, it, and my, I'm always fine tuning the teaching, fine tuning my approach. And so I get, I become better and better. And it's obvious, right? We're, we're just here now. This only now is real. Mm -hmm. As Barry Long, the spiritual teacher, said. And, was it? Remember, heard of Barry Long? Well, uh, I interviewed Bernie Pryor a few weeks ago, and he was a student of Barry Long. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I didn't have much uh, exposure to Barry. But, you know, like the power of now, like I've told you, it's, mm -hmm. it's, now is all there is. So when you say somebody woke up, or when you say you woke up, um, what do you actually mean by that? Not that it's a new concept to <clears throat> anybody who's listening, but it's kind of good to get each person's definition of it, because the definitions seem to vary a bit. Right. So I, I, my, so what happened with me was I was, my last year in chiropractic college in Davenport, Iowa, mm -hmm. had this health crisis. And uh, well, I thought I was going to die. For, I thought I'd die during the night. I, I couldn't breathe. And I, it turned out to be extreme anxiety. So that started on, on my spiritual journey. And I, it was just the teachings of Jay Krishnamurti and Zen and yoga. And, uh, and I had an enlightenment experience in 1977 uh, in, in Santa Rosa, um, sleeping next to my first wife. And I woke up and uh, I no noticed a shaft of sunlight coming from the chink in the Venetian blinds. And um, all of a sudden, my gaze was transfixed by these dust motes dancing in the sunlight. And every th I heard a morning dove cry outside, and every thought in my mind just fell away. And I experienced total peace and oneness with life. I never had an experience like that. I'd never any, done any drugs at the time. And uh, it was just a pure experience of like, everything I was seeking was here right now. I realized that. You'd done some meditating by that time, right? I, I'd been... been doing tea and meditation for two years. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, I, uh, and then gradually I kind of, the, the experience had faded and I reverted to somewhat back to my normal egoic uptight self, <laughs> really believing I was this me. And, um, but something had been, it changed permanently I, as, as if a hole had been punctured in my consciousness. And I was seeing the reality behind reality and I, I, I somehow knew I was that reality. So that began a journey of 18 years. For the next 18 years, I, even though I, I lived a normal life, uh, you know, going skiing and being a chiropractor and going to the theater in San Francisco and partying and so on, behind it all was this quest for enlightenment, for freedom. And what forms did that quest take? Did you continue meditating? Did you visit teachers? What did you do? To I, I, I continued meditating. I came and saw Krishnamurti speak here in Ojai in 1977. I had a number of other teachers like Dada, who was a, uh, not a very well-known teacher from India. But, and then I met um, Jean Klein in 1984. And he was the one who guided me to the film. It took a number of years. 11 more years before I woke up. And when I woke up, so this is what it brings me to the subject of awakening. So I was lying in bed one, 20 years ago, this spring actually, I woke up in Northern California. And I was lying in bed, and I woke feeling somewhat depressed. And my son who was 11 at the time, his mother and I got divorced when he was six. Uh, I was paying child support and his 
my son was staying with his mother down in Sebastopol, and I was living in a little cottage up on a hilltop near Sebastopol. I woke up feeling depressed, you know, I had difficult financial circumstances, and probably that was a cause of depression. I was about to get out of bed and go and meditate because I knew how to clear the depressed energy. But this particular morning, I lay there in bed and I said to myself, how come this is still happening to me? How come I'm still getting depressed? How come I'm not free yet? Because I'm pretty free already. And then I remember something John Klein had said, you're not the person you think you are. Find out who you really are and you'll be free. So I closed my eyes and went deeply into the interior of my own being with the question, okay, Jim, you say you're depressed. Who is this me who's depressed? I looked everywhere inside myself for the, uh, the thought form, I feel depressed, I am depressed. I couldn't find it. It was a, it's a thought form that comes and goes. But I, as awareness, consciousness, was right here. And somehow when, when that, hap that realization happened, I, the depression dissolved and I felt fine, went about my day. And the same thing happened the next morning and the next morning, three mornings in a row, I went, woke feeling depressed. And after that third morning, it was all over. I, I realized, my God, this I that I've been identified with, this me that I've been taking myself to be ever since about age two, it was just a fiction in my mind. It, it created all the feelings and emotions, the contractions, the anxiety, the guilt. It all just washed away. So you say you realize that. Um, that has a bit of an intellectual or conceptual connotation. Um, but was there more significantly a, an experiential shift at that point? It was the experience of what was just a feeling of great ease and flow and harmony. Mm -hmm. That was the experience. So there was kind of, in a way, both an experiential and an intellectual component to the to the package. Right. Exactly. The, right. the, the intellectual was, my God, I'm not my story. Mm -hmm. I have a story, but I'm not my story. The experiential was this feeling of great, uh, e I, I called ease, flow, and harmony. Mm. That's when, you, when you're awake, that's the basic experience. Mm -hmm. You're always at ease, you're always in the now, you're always harmonious with what is. And it's stuck. And it's stuck. It, it, it's, it, it's never shifted for 20 years now. There's a phenomenon called residues because we still have an ego, uh, we still have an I thought. Residues of old ego patterns can arise from time to time. And, you know, they, I remember. The first residue I had, had came up six months later when I again experienced, I got, I got caught up in my circumstances and kind of began being concerned, worried about my finances. And I thought actually I was losing my awakening. I hung out in a state of uncertainty for about four hours and then suddenly it just dissolved, shifted. I was back in the flow again, back in the state of ease, harmony and flow. So over the last 20 years, I'm sure that life has thrown plenty of things at you, including several strokes, which you'll talk about. Uh, but regardless of what it has come your way, that ease, harmony, and flow has persisted, predominated. That's, that's the abiding experience. Right. And that's what I would say when somebody wakes up to their true nature, you realize, well, uh, I am always in the state of ease, harmony, and flow. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, excuse the expression, shit happens, you know, things happen. And so to rock us, uh, and uh, those residues, and John Klein was the one who told me about residues. And I know John Klein himself experienced residues of old stuff, even when he was, I saw him six months before he died here in Santa Barbara. And he was, ex he was very, um, he was, couldn't do much. He needed round-the-clock care. And, and, and for a dignified, sophisticated European man, I'm sure it was, you know, somewhat disturbing to his well-being. But what choice did he have? But when I sat with him, the light of consciousness, the clear light of consciousness shone through his eyes as brightly as ever. I think uh, you'd probably agree that everybody has residues. Um, yes, we all and have residues. Traditionally, it's uh, pretty well discussed and understood that, you know, we have residues and yeah, in fact, in some cases, I think those residues can be quite substantial um, in in some people. And, you know, I mean, there are people who <clears throat> appear to have undergone some kind of awakening, such as Adi Da, 
but um, who had some pretty outrageous residues that they kept <laughs> indulging in for the rest of their lives. That, that's a little bit of a puzzlement to me. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I knew of Arida very well. I've read his book, The Need of Listening, mm -hmm. and um, I had a friend who was a doctor who had delivered a couple of his children, actually. Mm. And, um, yeah, he was a uh, paradox. I remember Samuel Bonder. I don't know if you've had him on a yeah, show. Yeah, I've interviewed Samuel yeah, yeah. and Linda, yeah. I remember him when he was about to leave the organization, about to leave Adidas' side after being with him for 20 years. Adidas threatened him with lifetimes of hellish karma if he had ever left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's, I don't want to get us sidetracked, but it, it is kind of um, interesting to ponder and to, if we really want to understand what this whole enlightenment awakening thing is all about then these things come up and you, you kind of have to come to terms with them you know i mean teachers behaving badly and so on uh and um it's not going to be certainly the focus of this interview but it if we you know if we really want to understand what enlightenment is then a lot of people are thrown by these occurrences when they are impacted by them personally or read about mm -hmm. them or somewhat they think you know I've, I've seen people just give up on the whole spiritual quest or just get very disillusioned or you know get, get very confused and all and so I think it's important to kind of probe such things and try to come to some sort of understanding and, and the residue idea helps in my in my book you can have and also uh you know ken wilber's idea of lines of development and stages of development and, and so on that you know one awakening does not enlightenment make necessarily there could be many stages of awakening and and there could be some in which there are still some fairly un undeveloped lines of development um along with some fairly well-developed lines and so anyway i don't want, want to go on too long but what do you think about all that well, you know, I'm working on a new book, and um, I have a chapter called Healing the Wounds of the Past. Mm -hmm. Because this is exactly what you're referring to, like many Indian gurus, for example, who came here and then they, uh, and they had extraordinary energy, extraordinary awakenings. and uh, Charisma, yeah. Charisma, yeah, and ability to transmit you know, the energy and awaken others. But then they had all this dark stuff going on, you know, mm -hmm. sexual stuff, power stuff, money stuff. And because of their unresolved childhood wounding issues, I think. So we have to explore that. We, and, and this is one of the ways I work privately with people. Mm. I, 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 you have to have healed your past completely. You have to be at peace with every person in your past. Otherwise, uh, your past will come back to bite you in the ass. Yeah. I think in the case of the Indian gurus, it's sometimes a cultural thing too, where they might have been raised in an ashram situation and not exposed to all kinds of stuff that they they are suddenly confronted with when they all come right. come to the West and you know have all kinds of issues around that stuff that they didn't know about. But um, so the question from what you just said is, um, do, does healing your is healing your past to what extent is healing your past a prerequisite to awakening, and to what extent can it be handled after awakening? Uh, it's both. Both. Um, for example, I, you know, I'm in a new relationship with my sweetie, sweetheart, Tanya. I've been married twice, divorced twice, and Tanya's a bit younger than me. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been together now for almost three years. And I, I had a certain degree of mother wounding that I wasn't even aware of. Uh, you know, and, and the mother wounding, the father wounding happens when you don't have a clear memory of being loved or nurtured by your mother or father when you were young. And so here I am, you know, 68 years old now. 68? Uh, 68 years old wow. now. Wow, you look pretty good for 68. No, yeah, thank you. Better than I do, I'm only 65. <laughs> <laughs> At least on the video. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, so, but I had become aware of this mother wounding and, and how it comes up, you know, how it manifests. So I've, I've been looking at that more and more and getting um, free of that issue. So, and I've been, I've been awake for like uh, 20 years now. So awakening just means you, you no longer suffer personally. Mm -hmm. and, um, but you can create suffering in other people if you if have these unconscious patterns still. So the work of refinement, of attunement, of uh, refining one's awakening uh, is an ongoing process. Yeah, I think so. Lifelong. Um, so have you done that refinement and attunement and so on um, 
completely on your own or in uh, have you ever like actually engaged in some sort of therapy or you know sat with some other teacher counselor of some sort in order to well, facilitate it since awakening no um, i haven't personally i've just done it on my own see the issue just has to be faced you know in shankara was supposed to have said realization consists of uh, um, seeing the truth and not in the least of 10 million years of act so it doesn't matter whether you meditate or you become a yogi or pur purify or fast, mm -hmm. none of that will awaken you. Only through seeing the truth you, do you awaken. And seeing that you're not this I, you're not this me, you have an I, you have a me, that's awakening. And, th and then seeing that you, uh, oh, I have my past, I have this issue, I have a tendency to uh, you know, lust after other women, which is one of the things about mother wounding, and people are always looking for the one, they're the perfect one out there. And even when they've got the perfect one, they're still looking for the one. They, that tendency, you just have to see that in yourself. Oh, I see that. And, I, and then the very seeing, it's a little bit, you get a little bit freer. When you see it from a place of true clarity and presence, mm. when you see your own behavior from a place of true clarity and presence, that, um, that is freeing. Incidentally, Shankar also said that um, jnana yoga is not necessarily for everyone, that, that sort of final insight into the one's true nature uh, and that karma yoga and seva things like that might be um, prescribed or conducive to the purification that would bring one to a state of readiness or worthiness uh, or ability to engage in uh, the kind of discrimination that might be needed for that final step um, So, I'm sorry, I, I kind of lost the train of thought of what you just fi said at, at the, towards the end there. Um, well, you know what? What? So did you? No, oh. but I, I had this insight 30 years ago. Uh -huh. we'll be no, there'll be another train along at the station any moment. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Because, it, because it's, it's not about the words. Right. It's always about the presence that we share with each other. Okay, so we're talking about residues and we're talking about working out this stuff that there might be still plenty to work out even after yeah. after realization, after awakening. And uh, you said it's been a sort of, for you, it's been sort of a, a kind of a, a process that you've been able to do on your own. And okay, yeah. now I'm remembering the question I wanted to ask, which is that after awakening and, and where that ease and, and frictionlessness that you mentioned earlier has come to be the norm, um, yes. Have you found that uh, there's a sort of an acceleration of the working out of stuff that that it comes up more readily and is resolved more readily than it might have been when you were more ego bound? Uh, yes, I think so. And, and you know, particularly, I'm, I live a normal life in relationships. You know, in, with Tanya and my sweetie, who's a very much a heart oriented person. Mm -hmm. She's a beautiful, open hearted, loving person, mm -hmm. and a bhakti, a true bhakti lover of God and um, so relationships as you know from your own marriage the, the, the best place to work a lot of this stuff out yeah yeah so I get to get to I get to meet myself every day and she has a beautiful uh, six-year-old daughter Bailey Rumi Martin and uh, so I get to in my, I have a 30 year old son by my second marriage so I get to be a stepfather to Bailey and and notice my Issues around that too. Mm -hmm. uh, my my tendency to want to be by myself or not participate it all comes up. Yeah, there's that saying, you know, that the world is your guru, and um, I, th I think an underlying principle to that is that if you know if everything really is orchestrated by some cosmic intelligence that permeates everything and abides everywhere, then the, the things that happen to us are not arbitrary and capricious, you know, they're actually perfectly designed to uh, bring about whatever it is we need to learn. Yeah, we, we, that's exactly right, yeah. It's all perfect. Life is the true teacher. Relationship mm -hmm. is the true teacher. Yeah. Okay, so you had this awakening 20 years ago, and um, it was it sounds like it was a real watershed event for you uh you know it was life after that day whatever day on the calendar that might have been has been different than it always had been before right. before that day was, was there any period even before this kind of final awakening where you kind of were 
got it, I lost it, I got it, I lost it kind of a thing? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, several times. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I thought that I was enlightened now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I remember when going to a Jean Klein event, a, a, a workshop at Mount Madonna Center in Northern California, and I was strolling down to the afternoon dialogue from my cabinet I was staying at, and um, I had this epiphany. I, suddenly my eye thought jumped out in front of me. I, I saw my eye thought. I realized I wasn't that eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I felt such a, I felt that tears, that tears of joy that, of seeing that, wow, I'm not this eye thought that I've been so identified with my whole life. Mm. I'm, I'm this pure awareness. And um, and I shared with John about it, and he said to me, um, he's actually recorded in one of his books, uh, The Transmission of the Flame, he said, you have in a certain way <clears throat> understood that you're not a person. Live in this uh, understanding and you'll be a happy man. And I thought, in the next few days, I thought, wow, well, I'm here now. <laughs> mm. And the very thought, wow, I'm here now, is, is, is the proof that I wasn't here. Yeah. Uh, because, and, I, and then, I, then I, some more suffering happened and I realized I, I wasn't finding enlightenment after all, but I was a bit freer. Yeah. What do you say to these people who, you know, you see them often in chat rooms online and stuff. I don't know if you frequent the chat rooms, but, you know, they'll, they'll take, take an explanation of the kind of thing you just said, that you're not a person and you're already free and you're already enlightened and there are no stages of development or levels of development and you don't really need to do anything and just kind of realize it. And they go on and on like that. Um, I keep getting the flavor that it's largely a sort of conceptual intellectual thing. They've, they've read too many books. And, uh, and they haven't necessarily imbibed the experience that, they're, that they've learned to describe yeah. with some degree of eloquence. Yeah, I, I agree. It's kind of a advisor, pure advisor, pure you know, advisor. It's almost like a uh, advisor police or something like that. Yeah, they're, they're actually told that. I mean, that, the, the, that term is actually used, you know, please pass the salt. Who wants the salt? <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. Um, anyway, so I, go so ahead. I do it. So, <clears throat> so this brings me a point. So, my my teachings, as I said, continuously evolve. In this new book, I'm working on the premise now of, of the, the the most powerful realization we can have is, wow, I'm not my mind. Mm -hmm. I have a mind, but I'm not my mind. I mean, that's one version of the most powerful realization we can have. Once you see that you're not your mind, you have a mind, but you're not your mind, then you're free. Then you're, you're abiding in the ease, harmony, and flow of the awareness or consciousness that is your true nature. And of course, awareness and consciousness are just pointers, what we fundamentally are. Um, yeah. And by the, same token, by the same token, would you say, I have an ego, but I'm not my ego? Exactly. We, I have an, so I have an I thought. So I have a section of my new book, um, a little lesson called noticing which eye is active in you. Mm -hmm. So is it the ego eye, the reactive ego eye, like, why wow, I don't like this happening at all, or is it the awakened eye, the functional eye? Mm. And uh, when we're awake and free, we, we speak always from our functional awakened eye. I must go to the doctor, I must get my car fixed, I must get my gas, put at the gas pump, right? <laughs> Which is why you came up with this beautiful name. Yeah. There's a, uh, there's a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon where Calvin is pounding nails into the coffee table with a hammer, you know, and his mother comes in and says, Calvin, what are you doing? And he looks at her like perplexed and says, is this a trick question? And uh, I thought of it when I was listening, reading your book because, um, you know, I mean, if, if you're pounding nails in the coffee table, you don't feel it. But if you accidentally hit your thumb with a hammer, you feel it. So there's a yeah. different, there, there's an eye sense which, yes. you know, which functions. And, you know, Jesus would have felt it, and Shankara would have felt it, and Ramana Maharshi would have felt it. There's, there's still some distinction in terms of our experience between this localized biological entity and the tree, the, yeah. you know, the coffee table, or whatever. Yeah, that's one of the main things I look for, actually, when I, when I do satsangs or workshops um, or private sessions. I'm looking for where people I are still identified with, how they use their eye thought. Are they... Mm -hmm. Does that suggest identification with their eye, or the, are they free? Hmm. And usually it's some kind of identification, deep identification, which I'm not even aware of. And that's where a teacher can play a role, or a guide can play a role, hmm. helping people, people become aware of, oh, I, 
I see how I'm identified with this. Would you say that there are degrees or levels of identification? Like you could be <clears throat> kind of cruising along f with a sense of not really being very identified, but then something can come up which you know, really triggers your identification and, and shows you that you're really not as free as you might have thought you were. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's true in relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I remember I, sometimes I get identified myself a residual identification with the, the me, the I, the ego, all pattern. I remember uh, the most recent one that happened when I was feeling uh, being controlled. And, you know, I thought to myself, God damn it, you know, I'm, I'm being controlled. And then I, I suddenly watched, I saw it from my wholeness, my global perspective. And I said, wow, that's an old, old pattern. I've been running away from control all my life. I, mean, I ran away from home physically, you know, when I was 14. Um, so did I. <laughs> yeah, but there you go. And uh, so that ego pattern can still arise from time to time. Mm. So, so I help people see that within what the, I help people see what they're not seeing themselves. That's the function of a guide. So do you think that if we have all these residual <clears throat> things, attachments or impressions or whatever they are, uh, and that they, they come up from time to time under certain circumstances and we kind of work through them and move on and, and then we're perhaps a little bit more free than we had been because something has been cleared out. Do you, yeah. think, do you think that if that's the case, that even in someone like yourself who's been awake for 20 years, there could still be a lot of stuff that's buried there, a lot of residual stuff, and if it somehow, theoretically, were to all just be, be, be cleared out all of a sudden, you would experience a much more profound degree of freedom than, than you're even experiencing right now. Well, I'm open to that, uh, but I, um, I'm a pretty inwardly vigilant person, mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, I'm a double Sagittarian. Sagittarius is the, the truth seeker of the zodiac, uh -huh. so I'm, I'm really attuned to truth, and uh, even though, and, um, and so, but I'm, op I'm just here now. Mm -hmm. There's only here now, and so I'm always open to a bigger realization, but that hasn't happened. Well, I'll ask you a question about that in a second, but perhaps you could quote that Nisargadatta quote where he was in his 70s and he, someone brought up the point about him kind of reacting in, to certain things or something. And you know the quote I'm talking about? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> well, he, he, it's in the book, I Am That. And mm -hmm. Somebody asked Nisargadatta, do you have experienced fear? And, and Nisargadatta was really honest in his answer. He said, occasionally an old reaction, mental, emotional, happens in the mind. Is, is, is it once seen and discarded? After all, one still has a personality, so one is still subject to the personality behaviors. And actually, I read that before I woke up, like 30 years ago, and that liberated me like, at some level tremendously because I, I was such a perfectionistic person. And I thought enlightenment had to be perfect. There was no, you know, once you were there, you're, once you're awake, then you felt no more fear at all. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, speaking of fear, uh, so, so it gave me permission to relax at a deeper level. That's what the Nisargadatta quote gave me. And then I, I'll talk about the strokes now because that was the first time I actually experienced physical fear. When I uh, had these series of strokes over five months, beginning in 19, uh, 2003, September 2003, I was working as a chiropractor. And to backtrack a little bit, I'd always been resistant to being a chiropractor. I, I, I wasn't like, it wasn't my thing. I wasn't passionate about it. I was a good chiropractor and I enjoyed working with people. But I, 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 it was something I resisted. I wanted to be a teacher. But once I woke up in 1995, all resistance melted. It still wasn't my passion, but I was no longer resisted it. That's the thing. When you wake up, all resistance in you goes to whatever it have, whatever arises. That's another way of looking at what at what awakening is. Mm, resistance is futile. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> resistance is futile. Like that's from Star Trek or something. Yeah, right. So anyway, um, so so eight years went by. I was doing satsangs in Sebastopol and you know doing a few private sessions and working my chiropractic practice, and I had these strokes. And after the second stroke, I had to quit practice. And I remember thinking, you know, well, thank God I'm now out of uh, practice. But I'm, and then I had a third stroke, which was really intense and devastating, mm. and put me in a hospital. And I remember um, for six days, and 
And then when I was lying in the, uh, on my gurney in the ER when I went to the hospital after the first stroke, the, the uh, physi physician came by and said, you need to sign this waiver. And I looked at it, he was going to do an, uh, it was an intervening radiologist. He was going to do an a angiogram. It would reject a fluid on my uh, femoral artery and go into the brain and they look at my brain on a TV and let's see what, if there's a block there, a blockage, and he would, if there, he could, he would insert a stent to open up the blockage. But it, it might kill a, you. Exactly. It was a 25% chance of either having a major stroke, even worse, or a, a being fatal. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember just this fear coming over me. Fuck, I could die. And, uh, and then I'd relax and breathe and sign on the dotted line and it turned out that the, uh, the, the blocked arteries are too deep so I didn't do a stent anyway. And um, I, um, I remember after six days in the hospital for an intensive care, I came, was driven home to my then girlfriend's place in Santa Rosa. And, you know, I, I couldn't smooth the right side of my face. I could hardly raise my right arm. I walked with a limp. I'd lost 20 pounds. I couldn't think clearly. I couldn't speak properly. This is all post-awakening. Post-stroke. Post, but it's also post-awakening. Yeah, right. right. And, and, and I, I just flowed with the whole thing. You know, mm -hmm. I had this one moment of fear, and then I realized, well, and I, and I just relaxed and signed the waiver. Mm -hmm. But after I came back to my girlfriend's house, I couldn't think clearly. But as I was lying in bed in her place, and... Uh, Suddenly, this, this, my thoughts gradually settled and cleared, and I had this single discrete thought, thank God I'm free. Hmm. Thank God I'm free. Because I knew myself as consciousness. Once you know yourself as consciousness, as, as this here now, you realize that what you fundamentally are was never born and never dies. That frees you from the fear of death. Yeah. And I want to emphasize that that's not just an intellectual concept, that's your experience. Um, it's a, that's my experience, yeah. yes. Because, you know, we can all read books that give us those concepts and read NDE books and so on and so forth. But, you know, you're, you're living from a place where, you know, primarily you are that which never dies. And, you, uh, exactly. And you, yeah. you, 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 that's your embodied experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just face, you, if you, you face your actual death, if it, if it happens, it will happen one day. With the same way you face life, you're just right there, here now, yeah. present with what is. I think one, way, one nice way of explaining it and understanding it is that, you know, we, we could think of dimensions, you know, and there's, there's that dimension which never dies and which is perpetual and silent and stable and, you know, rock-like. And then there are these more manifest dimensions which die and change. And, uh, but, you know, if, if our experience incorporates the full range, then there's a kind of a a safety and security uh, established in that dimension, which is, you know, yes. indestructible. Yes. Yeah. So... <clears throat> Your whole story, by the way, reminds me of the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, when Christ knew what was going to happen to him. And this, apparently, this wave of fear, and you know, came up. It's like, oh, can, yes. can you let this cup pass from me? And uh, then he kind of relaxed and said, all right, thy will be done. Yeah, exactly. And then so the... That I had this thought that, thank God, I'm free. And then I, a few minutes later, I had another thought. Well, I'm free, but do I want to live? Mm. Do I want to live? And I realized then that if I wanted to live, I had to f use my mind to form an intention to heal myself. Mm -hmm. That's the power of intention. I realized when I was only 57 at the time, my book, End Your Story, Begin Your Life, wasn't yet finished. And mm -hmm. I wanted to, I enjoyed teaching. And, you know, hell yeah, I want to live. So I formed this clear intention, yes, I want to live. And that's using the mind to form a clear intention. Mm. And then I, and I visualized every day my brain, uh, my blood vessels opening up from my brain, the blood flowing through, healing the things that need to be healed. I began walking again and went back to the gym again. And here I am today. That's great. Incidentally, the, the fellow who does all the video post-production for this show, Ralph Preston, um, had a fairly serious stroke some years ago and was, it was predicted that he really wouldn't be able to walk or do all kinds of things ever again. And he applied himself to rehabilitation with great dedication and now he, 
you know, hikes on the beach and rides his bicycle and he works with other people helping to rehabilitate them. Um, so, and I just want to do a shout out to Ralph and appreciation for him and yes. you know, what he's gone through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, stroke is a third leading cause of death after heart attack and cancer. So it's mm. pretty serious stuff. So uh, anyway, that's the story of my strokes. And of course, I've, uh, you know, I have a story about my strokes. And it's, as time goes on, I've, it's been like, uh, gosh, uh, 10 years or more, t 10 years more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this whole thing of story, I mean, we haven't talked about that too much, but there's a lot in your book and in your teaching about you, you are not your story and other teachers teach that way too, talk that way. So let's talk about that a little bit about, you know, what one's story actually is and why it's important to realize that you're not your story and, and so on. Yeah, good. Wow. Oh. And so your story all... begin your life. I mean, that's the yeah. title of your book here. Yeah. <laughs> so it's important to talk about. Yeah, it's a, um... so we all have a story. We're a storytelling people. Mm -hmm. And we all have a story, we all have many stories, and the older we get, the more stories we have, right? And, but, but the thing to notice is that our stories come and go, they shift and they change. And we've forgotten many stories when, from when we were younger. So the realization is that realizing that, wow, I have a story, but I'm not my story, because it comes and goes. And this is what I teach people. This is the main thing I teach. You've got to be inwardly vigilant and watch how your thoughts and stories and beliefs and everything comes and goes. And as, as you watch them come and go, you, you ask yourself, so what is always here? And you, of course, as awareness are always here. You as presence, as consciousness, as beingness are always here. So enlightenment or awakening is about discovering what is always here. Yeah. So in your book, you offer some examples of stories. Uh, I am not worthy. I feel guilty. I feel ashamed. I was an abandoned child, abused, wounded child. Nobody would want to be with me. Life is tough, unfair. This shouldn't be happening. The only way you can get ahead is by ripping people off. You can't trust anyone. I don't manage money well, and so on and so forth. So there are all these sort of stories that are kind of based on people's experience, you know. Yes, but yeah. what, what you're saying is experience can be deceptive. And, well, go ahead. You, you respond. Well... <clears throat> Maybe you were a lost and abandoned child when you were young, but you're not being lost and abandoned now. Like, so you come back to here now. And I remember I was teaching in Esalen, you know, you mentioned Esalen. I actually am not teaching there currently, but I taught there for this work for eight years. But one, one Esalen workshop, a woman came in, and she was in the mid 40s and she was very overweight and she shielded herself because she was shielding herself against men through her weight. Turned out her father had molested her and abused her sexually when she was very young. And she had never forgiven her father. She carried the memory of her father's molestation. I remember, as she shared a story, and I remember telling, uh, listening to her, and she sang to me in the group, how can, you, how can you say my story is not real? It really happened. I said, yes, it was real then, but it's not real now. No one's molesting you right now in this moment. And she kind of got it. Mm -hmm. And she, she realized that, and she began, by the end of the workshop, she said she began to forgive her father already. So it was a, uh, that's how people become free. They realize the story is real once, but it's not real now. What, what is, what's happening now is what is real now. But there are things that are happening now to people that are pretty intense. I mean, they might be going bankrupt and losing their home and not knowing, you know, afraid they're going to be sleeping on the sidewalk or something. Right. Um, so those things are hap There are things happening in the moment, not just things that happened years ago. Right. So, uh, so when that's kind of a situation, I would tell. Well, let's take a person who's, uh, I don't know, sleeping on the sidewalk. Um, so this leads us to the understanding, the, the, the seeing, the, you know, the, all, all, we have all these stories about reality, like I'm, 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 on the, I'm sleeping on the sidewalk now, I'm homeless. I'm just waiting to buy the new iPhone. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, good. Uh, but that may be somebody's story, but maybe somebody is on the street and then they don't have a roof over their head and then they don't have any money to buy an iPhone. Right. So I would counsel them in this way. So uh, yes, you're homeless, but right now, do you know? Do you know the the storyteller? Do you know the I, the me? Do you know 
because the storyteller, the I, the me, the ego self, which is behind all the stories, when you look into that, this I, this me that you take yourself to be, you discover that this, it, the storyteller, is no more real than the stories it tells. It's the biggest story of all, this I, the me, the storyteller. And when you see that, wow, I am the storyteller that I've taken myself to be all these years that has difficult circumstances that is on the streets. When you see that that's not real because it comes and goes and you're not anything that comes and goes. Then they say a pause, a break. A, a, and you suddenly just discover yourself in this place of just pure awareness, pure beingness. Now, you had an advantage in a way. Um, and I've had an advantage in terms of spiritual practice going on for decades that it makes it a lot, in my opinion, makes it a lot easier to see this stuff. Uh, but if you get a room full of people and they've never really had a background like that and you just start saying these things to them, isn't there a tendency to become somewhat manipulative of one's experience and just sort of start playing mental games with yourself, trying to see this and trying to ha have that perspective without really having undergone the kind of transformation that, that might make it easy to see that stuff quite um, spontaneously and naturally without having to, you know, work at it. What do you think? Well, I... Um... In other words, well, if, if you're having trouble with that question... Um... No, I'm not having trouble with that question okay. at all. Go ahead. I, I, I don't have trouble with any question. <laughs> well, what I want to say to you... Mm -hmm is that, as I say in my new book, the teaching is in the words, the transmission is in the silence. Mm -hmm. So it's not about thinking about any of this stuff. It's about, yes, I, I also sometimes say we shift from silence to story, from story to silence. And the more grounded we are in the silence that is our true nature, mm -hmm. the presence, the beingness that is our true nature right here, right now, the more we uh, see, ah, this is so, we can see what he's talking about. Like, I have a story, but I'm not my story. I be, people begin to see that for themselves. They be, begin to glimpse it. Maybe they don't get a small glimpse, but they begin to have a glimpse. Yeah. So to take an extreme example, if we were to walk into a psychiatric hospital and give a talk to a room full of psychotics, uh, and, 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 you know, just to take an extreme example and say, you know, you're not your story and blah, blah, blah. Uh, there, it just wouldn't, it would be like Christ said, you know, throwing the seeds onto rocky ground or something. There wouldn't yeah, exactly. be the, the receptivity to really know what you were talking about. So, right. so what you're saying is that if one could culture the ground of silence, then, uh, then such instructions as you might give in a seminar become more fruitful. Uh, exactly. So how do you culture the ground of silence? Well, how does one? the more present the guide or teacher is, mm -hmm. the more established and true presence and beingness, the more it, um, the more effect you have. Like, I'm a, um, I'm a Vietnam vet. Are you, do you know that about me? Right. So you, sure, from your book and your, your yeah, talks. Yeah, so, yeah. So you, I, and so I'm, I'm doing some work with vets now. Mm, good. Now, now, veterans and, uh, you know, Iraq veterans and mm -hmm. Afghanistan and... Uh, even Vietnam veterans. And so veterans are actually trained to be supremely present, right? I mean, that, that's the main thing about being a combat warrior. You have to be extremely present mm -hmm. on the lookout for the enemy. So this gift of extreme presence, supreme presence, they already have that. So it's translate that into, mil uh, into civilian life. So it's about being supremely present. Breathe, uh, breathe into your, down into your belly, unlock your knees the sense of being here now. And then from this place of being supremely present, then we begin to look at these things. Mm. Trouble with veterans is that they tend to be, you know, if they have PTSD, they tend to be locked into the fight or flight response, you know, right. long, long right. since, long past the time when it was appropriate. It's, yeah. be, it's become habitual and that's what stress does with people. So, um, you know, you're saying that you can get them to sort of decondition from the fight or flight response, I think, and by, well, what you were just saying, breathing, unlocking your knees. You, you, so you're teaching a sort of a little bit of a meditative practice where they can kind of yes. chill a bit and, uh, and settle into a more silent state. 
Right, exactly. I, I um, you know, I, I used to teach this work called somatic technique, mm -hmm. and, and to chiropractors, I did professional chiropractic seminars for many years, ten years, uh, to teaching chiropractors. And I learned it from Thomas Hanna. Do you know about Thomas Hanna? He was taught at Esalen, and he taught the somatic work. And so this works about, about very, very much about being in the body, being in the body in a relaxed, harmonious way, mm -hmm. being very aware of your body, moving. You know, being supple. I still have a yoga practice. I do. And so this technique of breathing down into your belly, unlocking your knees, you know, relaxing your shoulders, wiggling your jaw loose, becoming very present here now. Mm -hmm. It's a simple meditation or somatic practice which brings people into more into the presence. And then they, they're more available to hear whatever I want to say next. Okay. And do you just do that in your workshops or do you advocate that people kind of make a habit of it? Yeah, well, I, I, I teach people how, how to do this, whether I'm doing workshops or private sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and because you're becoming more aware of yourself. People are so distracted these days, right? They're so caught up in Facebook, Twitter. They're always on their s s smartphones. I didn't even have a smartphone at this point. Me neither. I have a dumb phone. <laughs> <laughs> in and, fact, uh, I just bought my first cell phone about a month ago and haven't used it yet. Oh, is that right? <laughs> I've had, I have had a cell phone for years, but it's a flip, flip phone. Huh. My, my sweetie, uh, Tanya, has, a, of course, an iPhone, and she's on it all the time. Yeah, anyway, I mean, th that's, it's almost a, a parody. You see cartoons like that all the time where people are walking down the street staring at their phones, and you see you know, things on the news where, where people are running into lampposts or you know, <laughs> stepping into traffic or whatever. Cause, yeah, so, yeah. so there's definitely a, a lot coming at us in this culture. And uh, yeah. what you're, I think what you're saying is that you know, we're, we're so habituate, habituated to sensory stimulation that we never give ourselves a break, never give ourselves a moment's silence. Right, so it's a uh, some kind of one, one person among many, like all, you, all the people you interview on this, your show here, mm -hmm. we're all doing the same thing, where like waking up to our true nature is the solution to the suffering. It's the solution to individual suffering and it's the solution for global suffering. Yeah, we could talk about that a bit, and I don't know if we've exhaustively covered all the points we brought up yet, but maybe we're not supposed to do that, and this is a sort of a potpourri that we're, or, or you know, the smorgasbord that we're having here, and, and people, yeah. people can get more into your work uh, later on, but I, I like your emphasis on that, that um, individual awakening is kind of the unit of world betterment. Right, I, I, I mean, look at my history, I mean, I... I was a normal kid in New Zealand, ran away from home. My parents uh, were married, but divorce wasn't common. My parents didn't like each other, but they stayed together for the kids, you know. And, uh, <laughs> Sounds look what familiar. Happened. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I didn't, didn't know anything about spirituality, although I was always inclined in that direction. I remember eating uh, uh, health foods like at a young age because I was really kind of wheat germ. I remember wheat germ was a thing that I eight when I was in my teens. And yeah, I, you and I have a lot in common. I, <laughs> I used to eat wheat germ and drink tiger's milk and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> and, um, but and it's all brought us to this place here now. We're, we're, like, we're right here now. And this is, and so awakening brings you to here now. Mm -hmm. It brings you back to what is fundamentally true, always true in this present moment. And then so, and you realize that when, you, when you're here now, free of your story, because you, you realize that you have a story, but you're not your story. You're free of the I story, the storyteller, then you're free, then you're awake. And you realize, wow, this, this is, feels absolutely the best. This is the greatest realization of all, to realize this. And so you want to share it with people. And some people, you know, share it just with their neighbors or friends or family. Others like us are more interested in the, taking the message out there in the, into the world. Yeah. And uh, perhaps you could elaborate on, I, I mean, to my understanding, individual awakening is, if you'll pardon the oxymoron, is um, conducive to world transformation, not merely because awakened people might tend to share it, 
uh, overtly, you know, through giving talks or writing books and, and so on, but just because of what they are, even if they just live a, a normal life and keep it a secret that they've had an awakening, they're going to radiate an influence. And, and if enough people were radiating such an influence, we'd see a very different world. Right. I remember Maharishi, your original teacher, talked mm -hmm. about, you know, 1% of the world waking up. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, even the square root of 1%, he got down to at a certain point, <laughs> because he, oh, did, right. he realized 1% wasn't happening. <laughs> <laughs> but I think actually it is happening these days. I mean, there, there seems to be some sort of epidemic taking place, uh, as evidenced by the show and all the people I have to interview and all, all the you know, people like yourself. And it's, you know, in the 1950s, you wouldn't have seen anything like this. There was Yogananda, uh -huh. you know, and there were, there were a couple of things, but it, it really wasn't much in the, in the world, in the national collective consciousness. Right. Yeah, I know a man, actually, a friend of mine who uh, was in the Yogananda organization for years. Mm -hmm. And then she left disillusioned because it promised self-realization, but he wasn't self-realized. The person, your friend, wasn't. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. He, he worked in that organization for many years. And then he, he met me and we we began having non-dual discussions, dialogues, mm -hmm. and uh, had an awakening, and now he's off and running on oh, his great. own. That's and good. teaching. Yeah. Well, that, you know, I think people come into this life at different stages of development, and uh, I know people who have been self-realized since childhood, and I know others who have been meditating for 45 years and aren't self-realized. So it kind of, you know, we all have a different row to hoe. But, I mean, getting back to one of the points you brought up in, in my introduction to your book, um, your attempt, you, you think that 20 years is too long a time to spend uh, before oh, yeah. it, it that, that it really can be shortened down to nine months, three years, something along those yeah, lines. Exactly. Within, definitely within, you know, some, t some people nine months, others a year or so. But mm -hmm. when you really focus on all this work, when you uh, really want to wake up, and you have to have an urgency, an inner drive to awaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's got to be there, I think. And, and, and some people wake up spontaneously, like Eckhart Tolle, uh, Byron Katie, just, they weren't even seeking it that happened. So what I've learned in this world is anything can happen. Yeah. Of course, in their case, they had sort of bottomed out, you know. I mean, they yeah. were, uh, she, Byron Katie was in a halfway house and, and, or some kind of rehabilitation house, and Eckhart Tolle was on the verge of suicide. And, you know, they'd somehow bottomed out and bounced up. Um, but as you say, it can happen so many different ways. Yeah, there's an endless variety of uh, endless variety of ways it can happen. Yeah. Um, but what is it you? We got a new dog. Um, what is it you do uh, to cut twenty years down to nine months or or two years or, or you know how are you able to you know um, cut short the what for most people is a, a decades long process. Um, by the, the degree of presence I bring to the, um, my work, mm -hmm. by the degree of focus on what is essential, mm -hmm. what, it, what it must be seen essentially, you must see that you're not your story. And how I, so I, I take real life examples. So when I'm working with an individual, I ask them where they're suffering, where they're not yet free. I keep bringing back to, okay, so, and they, they get free. Uh, they, they're no longer an issue for them in that area. So where are you not free now? Where are you not free now? Hmm. And again, where are you not free? Where are you not free? Until suddenly they realize uh, at some point that... Um, so you dig right to the core of it. Right, to the underlying core. And it usually dates back in most cases to a early childhood trauma, they're still identifying with this I, this me, that was abandoned, neglected, abused, uh, didn't feel wanted. Hmm. And, uh, and when they see that, the more they see that with clearly, and I, and, you know, I have little practices like self-forgiveness and uh, 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 being with a person like you, who are, you, you're afraid of your father, or you're afraid of your mother, being with them, and it, even though they're long dead now, being coming, inviting them into your meditation, looking into their eyes, and being with the fear that comes up, and until you can see their eyes with compassion and kindness, mm -hmm. you see that well, they're suffering because they were abused as a young child, 
the, and so I helped them see all that. Mm -hmm. So you were with Jean Klein for about 11 years, yes. um, and, but by your current standards, 11 years would be a failure uh, in, terms, no. in terms of, you know, you, you're hoping to wake people up a lot quicker than that. So you're, you're saying that perhaps you're doing something that, I don't, I'm sure you don't want to com compare yourself in, in that way with Jean Klein, but in a way you're doing something that gets right to the core of it more quickly than, than whatever he was doing. Right. Well, uh, he, was, he, he was always um, teaching the direct path, right? Mm -hmm. The direct path is like right here, right now. Yeah. And so, you know, each student of his has, who's teaching now has found their own way of doing that, um, presenting that teaching. Mm -hmm. My teaching is uh, really helping people see that they're not their story. They have a story, but they're not their story. They're always, always this aware conscious person who is present right now. And I bring them to, I, there's a lot of silence in my dialogues with people. A lot of connection, just pure connection at a being to being level, even on Skype, mm -hmm. there's a lot of silence. I mean, I, one person I worked with recently, um, he talked about, uh, he's, he's a long time he, meditator. He, maybe you know him, so you know his name. TM, 30 years, guy in the 60s, and, and never quite felt free, never realized true freedom. And um, he was, um, he was, uh, he had many moments of freedom and he knew his true nature. He had many experiences of his, his true natures as ease and bliss and harmony. But there was this chronic kind of constant ball of unhappiness in his stomach, he described it, which was sometimes more intense than others. Well, so as we explore his story, turns out that his relation with his sister, um, he had a problem with his sister. He didn't like her. They had a conflict. And so we went more deeply into that. And as he, we went more deeply into that, and he be, became more forgiving and more seeing clearly, wow, I do have this issue with my sister. Just having seeing it is freeing. Seeing is freeing. And the more, the more deeply you look at something, the, the area where you're stuck that you have a problem with, the more you, you're freer of it. And you, the more you relax, the more you feel more present. Hmm. And, um, and then eventually he realized uh, he'd totally forgiven his sister. He no longer had an issue with her. And that ball of unhappiness was basically gone. Wow. Interesting. So there's a sort of a psychotherapeutic quality to what you're doing with people. And um, I guess, I mean, how did, how long did it take you to suss out that, that, that this issue with his sister was, was important? Did it, did it come right up? Uh, it, it came kind of up in the first few sessions. Mm. And then, you know, it took a few more sessions to, he had a series of 10 sessions with me. Mm -hmm. And, um, but uh, in, and I've done a lot of psychotherapy myself in the past. Wow. When I was before I woke up, I remember doing psychotherapy. We were working with a psychotherapist on my relationship with my second wife, mm -hmm. and um, I actually had experience of uh, working with with a psychotherapist. And I was exploring whether I wanted to, to, to divorce my second wife, which I ultimately did. And um, I remember, and I was studying with John Klein and kind of absorbing his teaching. And then suddenly I, I, I was, found myself crying in the midst of a psychotherapy session and uh, at the thought of leaving my wife. And, and then I had this experience, I, I kind of shifted back my awareness and I was able to observe myself crying. I, as consciousness, was able to observe Jim Drever, the character, crying and weeping. And uh, that was an, a moment of epiphany. Um, because I realized, wow, I'm, I'm not my story then, I'm not my tears, I am the consciousness in which the tears in the story appear and disappear. That was an illuminating moment in mm. my journey. Yeah. A um, little bit of a shift in topic, but um, you mentioned, you know, it's been about 20 years since your awakening, um, and we've talked about residues and work, working through residues as, as they come up. Um, if you look back over the last 20 years, um, do you, is there something much kind of more refined or more rich or complete in some way about your, your natural state now than there was, let's say, a week after your awakening? Has it 
has it continued to evolve in some way? Absolutely. Can you describe that? Absolutely. It's, a, it's deeper, more mature, richer, more clean, more clear, fewer words, but the words are like more right on. Mm -hmm. More embodiment, I would say more embodiment. Yeah. Would it be true to say that um, as far as your, your innermost true nature is concerned, that can't really change because it's non-changing in its nature, but the, uh, you just word, used the word embodiment, but the embodiment of it, the, the living of it, the expression of it through your mind, body, senses, intellect, words, right. all, all those things, there, that there's plenty of room for continued improvement or refinement in those dimensions. Absolutely, yeah. Right, it is. It's, it's, it's more embodied, it's expressed more cleanly, more impeccably. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure that will continue to refine and evolve. But the, the knowing of my true nature, um, which is being my true nature, mm -hmm. you know, once you know yourself as consciousness, that's, you, you, you know yourself as the universe. That's the realization. You, you are the universe expressing through my eye, the, these eyes, just as everybody else is the universe expressing through their eyes. If everybody realized they were the universe expressing through their eyes, feeling with their heart, sensing with their body, listening with their ears, uh, then we'd have a world which would be truly universally uh, harmonious, cooperative, working together to solve out the problems of living, the challenges of living. Yeah, I hear people say that, that use that expression, I am the universe, um, but um, it's like, to, to my mind, the universe is a manifest thing. There's planets and stars and galaxies and all that stuff. And so are, are you somehow saying that you are all those cosmic you know, events and bodies expressing through this human body? Or do you really mean more like universal awareness? Exactly, yeah, exactly. That, ex awareness. that expresses through this body as it does, as it manifests as the moon or as the sun or as right, the exactly. expresses through the, the antelope or whatever. Yeah yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that correction. I will bring that to my attention. Yes, I'm the universal awareness. Right. We, are the, we are the universal awareness. Yeah. Okay, good. Of consciousness. Yeah. And once you know yourself as the universe, you know, an important part of my teaching is that once you, once you realize your true nature, you realize you're bigger than anything that can happen to you, mm -hmm. even your own death. Mm -hmm. That's how you can be at peace with death. Even your, the worst pain, you're bigger than that. You as universal awareness are, are infinite. You're right. The universe is infinite, vast. Yeah. Um. I, th I think that's important. I mean, there, you know, you, f you read stories of people who've had NDEs, near-death experiences, and, and generally speaking, after having had such an experience, it's, they're not morbid about it, but they kind of like look forward to death because they realize it's not the end of the story and it's actually a beautiful thing, not a scary thing. There's, there, you know, this, the, this essential nature of what I am can't be exterminated. Um, so, I mean, what a much nicer way to live than than in a state of, oh, oh well, I only got 10 years left and then I'm going to utterly cease to exist. <laughs> yeah. It's a nicer story, I agree. Yeah. But it's still a story, right? I mean, I write about the uh, subject of death in my new book. I write about the subject of death and the end of story beginning your life too, but the, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we've heard many stories of what happens after we die, right? Mm -hmm. Reincarnation, and, and, golden light, a tunnel where you meet your loved ones who have passed mm -hmm. over. And these are all nice stories and you can choose whatever story you want to believe. But ultimately, when you're truly free, you let go of the story and you're just here now. And you'll, you live here now. You're always living in the pre this moment here now. Yeah. So I, I agree that um, those are stories. They may be true stories. I mean, maybe that stuff does happen after you die and, and, and so on, but it's not by virtue of believing in those stories that you're going to get any real freedom from fear. It, it's by actually experientially knowing yourself to be that which is beyond change, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Beyond change. That's the, uh, that's the key. What doesn't change? There's a website used to be called nevernothere.com. Oh, yeah, Richard Miller. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. now in... Uh, Last I heard, he was in Thailand living with a young, much younger Thai woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so Never Not Here describes 
perfectly what enlightenment is. Mm -hmm. Enlightenment is awakening to never, what is never not here, which is awareness or consciousness as we are. Everything else comes and goes. Everything else changes. Yep. Everything. The Gita says that the unreal has no being, the real never ceases to be. Yeah, beautiful. Um, there is a tendency for people to say, well, there is, you know, I've heard you say in your, in your book or maybe in your talks, you know, you look within, you can't actually find any little nugget of a personal identity that's in there, kind of like a puppeteer pulling strings. And um, th there, is, there is a whole group, actually, which leads people through a process where they, they kind of see that, and then they kind of proclaim the person to be liberated because they've seen that they can't find any personal entity uh, inside. Um, personally, I think there's a bit more to it than just you know going through an intellectual process. But there are also, there are also people who reject the notion of reincarnation and so on because they say that for that to be a real phenomenon, there would have to be an entity which would you know move from one body to the next. Uh, and yet, all the the ancient traditions say that, or most of them say that, well, that's actually what happens. So, um, yeah. I don't, personally, I don't see an incompatibility between uh, those different perspectives. I think it's, it's a matter of where you take your stand. Uh, but I, I've said enough now, let, let's let you respond. Yeah, so I personally think, it's, I was to choose a story, reincarnation is a story. Mm -hmm. Because I've, I've actually had two experiences of reincarnation uh, before I woke up. Past life Maybe. kind of things. Yeah, right. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. Very uh, real. I was led through a melodic regression about 40 years ago, and I had experienced two past lives which made things I was struggling with in this life, and it made perfect sense. Yeah. So, but the fact is that as a human beings, we incarnate, right? I have, I have one child, and I've, I've now got a stepdaughter. And so, when human, two, a male and a female come together, make love, and they have children. You know, have children, then that's incarnation. Yeah. Now, there's, there's no, once you wake up, you realize there's no person who incarnates. It's just in, physical incarnation, biological incarnation, which is, goes on for, has gone on for, uh, since the beginning of human history. So that continues. But you, uh, and so my, uh, when this body dies, Jim Drever dies, you know, um, he, uh, he'll, he'll live on through my son. This energy of, there was kind of me and was Drever like right? My son bears some resemblance to his, me and his mother. And then he got his own unique patterns. Hmm. There may be more to it than that, though. Um, you know, like we were saying earlier on that, you know, you you have an ego, but you are not your ego. You know, you, 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 right. you there's a sort of a, a, an eye sense that you have. And, um, you know, in Sanskrit, they call it the jiva, that there's, there's some um, subtle entity, some subtle body that uh, outlives the physical body and actually takes, uh, takes birth in a new one. Uh, like you, you know, you experienced past, uh, past lives when you were regressed. And so, I don't think that's incompatible with saying that, you know, that's not ultimately what you are, that jiva that it reincarnates. You are ultimately the universal awareness, as we were discussing a few minutes ago. Um, it's just a matter of sort of being a little bit more multidimensional about it. Yes, and and yeah. actually, the woman I interviewed last week, Aisha Salem, she's, most of her instruction, she says, and she, she's really quite a profound person, has been from, uh, you know, Tibetan Buddhist masters who died hundreds and even thousands of years ago who were some, uh -huh. somehow living on some level, pulling, you know, intervening and, and guiding people uh -huh. uh, on this plane of existence. So, you know, don't want to get too esoteric on us here, but I'm open to those kinds of possibilities. And, and there's a tendency with some, some people to just brush them all away and say, no, nah, that's all just sort of imagination. Yeah. No, like, you know, we live in a world where there's all this multiplicity of dimensions and experiences, and the more awake and free you are, the more you're open to everything. Yeah. No, and so, 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 like, ego, for example, a little bit of the Jim Drever ego is in my son, Adam Drever. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, because it, it, 
the so the ego patterns maybe that's how it carries through yeah yeah sure. Well, the, uh, Christ said the sins of the fathers are visited upon the sons or some such yeah, thing. Yeah, right, right, and exactly. I actually had experiences on long meditation courses of experiencing my parents within me so vividly. It's like the, the whole flavor of their personality was seen within my own makeup, you know, and I, I was kind of working through that and dwelling on it and all. Right, right. We, we, you know, my father was a, um, a, a great snooker player and, and it, like love to play poker He's, he, and my son is now a professional poker player oh, amongst yeah. other things and uh, so and, and i was good at poker too and you know snooker when i was younger and mm -hmm. i and, but i was, was looking for the thing that i wanted to do most i just was always had this quality of uh i just wanted to find the one thing that i could excel at and excel at that i, I could do many other good things well but um i wanted to find what I excelled at and this is what i'm doing now yeah and uh but so this question of you know the, the gambling li lineage is, is there, there too. The family I'm sure, dharma. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sure my father's father was probably the same. You know. Mm. Yeah, interesting. All right. So um, your book and your story begin your life. Um, I just wanted to sort of quickly breeze through the chapters. I, I've read about half of it. Uh, every, every week it's a new book, and I get as far as I can through each one. And I was really enjoying this one. Um, so um, if, we, if we breathe through, let me just read the chapter titles. And, and you interrupt me if you feel like there's something in that chapter that we haven't talked about yet that you'd like to elaborate a little bit okay. on. Okay, so um, introduction, the practice of freedom. Chapter one, be present with your experience. And you mentioned the practice of meditation. Chapter two, notice the story. We've talked about that quite a bit. Chapter three, see the truth. Chapter four, questioning this me. Chapter five, or wait, wait a minute, what happened here? Oh yeah, questioning this me, and in there there's the practice of self-inquiry and the practice of freeing. Chapter five, awakening to freedom. Uh, chapter six, the power of love. Okay. Okay, good. Let's, let's discuss love. So, yes. So, <clears throat> I have a saying, awareness without love is dry and empty. Mm -hmm. Love without awareness is messy and emotional. Nice. But when the two come together, we dance in freedom, joy, and harmony. It's beautiful. Did you write that? Yeah, I wrote that. Very nice. So it's a, um, and this is the dimension that, that Tanya, my sweetheart, has brought in my life. Mm -hmm. She's brought the love dimension. I'm, I, because I've always been kind of intellectual, detached, you know, kind of uh, my psychological makeup was kind of standoffish. And she's really brought this dimension of whole dimension of love and beauty in my, into my life. And she's the most loving person I've ever met. And so it's a, um, it's great. And so I've, I've really opened up to this dimension of love. And, you know, love is what it's all about. And in human relationships, it's about love and kindness and generosity and compassion. And so awareness, as I see it, the more aware we are, the more present we are the more our heart opens. The more, the freer of our story we are, the more our heart opens to love and all those wonderful, warm and juicy things. Co warm and cuddly, as I subscribe. <laughs> I've, been a, I've never been particularly a warm and cuddly person myself, but my God, I love to cuddle and snuggle with Tanya. That's great. Um, I've been thinking about what I might talk about at the science and non-duality conference in the fall and and you know when you think of the title science and non-duality both of those have a or could have a rather dry heartless connotation you know you think yeah. of the, the scientists with the pens and the pocket protector and the glasses you know yeah, right, so. and and even non-dual there have been a lot of non-dual teachers that are kind of emotionless and flat and yeah, right. and, uh, and yet the the greatest sort of scientists like einstein and niels bohr and others were these deep mystics you know who had a really kind of a Oh, kind of almost a religious appreciation or a mystical appreciation of uh, for the universe and uh, whatever intelligence is, is governing it. And the, also the greatest leaders in the non-dual field, people like Ramana and Shankara and Nisargadatta were great devotees as well as being yeah, sort right. of these brilliant clear intellects, you know, that uh, wrote devotional poetry and sang devotional songs and, and, and all kinds of stuff. So um, there's definitely that dimension. And, and, 
I've, I've noticed that it kind of develops a little bit sequentially sometimes where people will be kind of in a stage which is sort of flat and non-dual but without a whole lot of heart and then the heart thing will, will um, begin to dawn and I just want to read a, a brief thing here um, Adya Shanti and my friend Francis Bennett are going to be giving a talk up in San Rafael in, 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 towards the end of March and uh, from the, the excerpt from announcing that talk, they say in this postmodern Western movement of non-dual spirituality may be in the process of a kind of second wave expression, which may perhaps be more heart-centered than the first. That is, they will consider to oh, Adya and, and Francis will consider together a more devotional and integrative-based spirituality that's more appreciative of embodied human values and that's more open to an orientation of service and social justice in a world in crisis. So I, I kind of see that trend happening in, in the, the so-called non-dual community where there's a kind of a, a, a heartsiness that's, that's beginning to bubble up more and more. Yeah, beautiful. That's a beautiful uh, event, it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, if you probably go on either Adyashanti's or Francis's websites and you'll see an announcement of, I think it's on March 26th or so up in Santa Rosa. And of course, uh, if you're watching our interview two years from now, forget about it. This is 2015. But <laughs> <laughs> There'll be other things. All right. So, what more would you like to say about love? I kind of cut you off and, and started talking a lot, but well, I, one of my favorite quotes is uh, from Ramakrishna. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, the mind will get you into the uh, court uh, courtyard of the beloved, but mm -hmm. only uh, only the heart will allow you to enter the bedroom. Nice. Well, that's kind of kind of like what we're saying here, isn't it? That, yes, it is. Yeah, that there's an initial awakening that may have something to do with the mind. In fact, speaking of Adya again, he always spoke in terms of head, heart, gut, in terms of sta yeah. stages of awakening. Right. Nice. Yeah, so it's a, uh, and that's really the emphasis of my new book, because of the energy of love that Tanya's brought in my life and helped me awaken to. And, um, but, but my journey was, I had to get, become free in order for my heart to open. I think most people do, you know. I, I think if the, if there's not that foundation of deep freedom, then then as as they say, it's it's sort of like a small trying to rise up in great waves of love is like a small pond trying to rise up, rise up in great waves. It can't really do it. It just stirs up the mud at the bottom. You need to be an ocean for the you know for the tidal waves to really start to to, to rise. Right. So it's. <clears throat> Along those lines, I, I say now that, you know, once you've found freedom, what is it to do but to love and serve? Beautiful. Which is another great point. I mean, to love and serve. Do you, do you have the sense in your own life that you've more and more become like an instrument of the divine, if we want to use that word, that you're, you're just sort of like, you know, you went through a preparatory stage and then you reached a certain degree of realization and... Now it's like you've given your life over to some some greater purpose, which through which, or on on behalf of which, you are kind of helping to to raise world consciousness. Yeah, in my own small way, I am. Yes, yeah, I feel, definitely feel that. Yeah, I think a lot of people feel that who are sort of working in a spiritual capacity like yours. That that they're it's not about them, obviously, um, and it's they're they're kind of serving as a conduit. Or an instrument of some sort. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. Beautiful. Nice. Um, okay, so in your in the love chapter, there are some practices for forgiveness and f uh, practices for eye gazing, and then uh, chapter seven is creating a new story for your life. Anything in there? We you want to? Yes, touch I want to, upon? See, talk, talk, want to talk about that because uh, because we still have a story, mm -hmm. and we still. As we get freer and freer, we get clearer and clearer. Our mind actually becomes much quieter because we're not telling ourselves any stories anymore. Because we've seen through this eye who's the storyteller. So our mind is actually about 80% quieter. And I have long periods with, with no thoughts at all. I'm just here now, present, aware. And then I'll use my mind to, if I want to communicate or create something, and so the, I write about the power of intention in my book, uh, in, in my love, the last chapter, the power of manifestation or intention. You, you're using intention in, to... In this book or the new yeah, book? Yeah, yeah, this new book. Okay. Uh, this, yeah. this book, The uh, End of Story Oh, yeah, the life. practice of manifestation, yeah. Yeah, so, the, so we, the, the, the more we know we're not our mind, 
the more we can use our mind as a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. Because that's, you know, I remember Eric Schiffman, a friend of mine from LA, who was a well-known in the yoga world, um, he's a yoga teacher. He, he said to me once, like 30 years ago, the mind is the ultimate toy. The mind is the ultimate toy. And so when we, we can really use that toy of the mind to uh, create with, and, and, and bring into our lives what we want to need. So, for example, I used the power of intention to heal myself from my strokes, right? When I had this realization that my, do I want to die or do I, I had no fear, but do I, or do I want to live? And yes, I wanted to live. I remember my son, when he came to live with me in LA, when I was living in LA, about, I moved down to LA in 20, uh, 2008. 2011, he came and lived with me. He was, he was a mess. He was addicted to weed when he he, he would get, drink alcohol he'd get drunk and violent and I was the only one that could handle it because I was, I was awake and I, I loved my son so I gave him space and eventually I realized that he needed to what he needed for me was to trust him I need I need he's a computer programmer and uh, now a professional poker player and so I, I, I learned to do that I trusted him completely and eventually after he began he got sober he stopped his use of weeds, alcohol. He's been now two years sober, clean and sober. Great. He, he did a complete 180 in his life. And I visualized that. I used the power of intention. I visualized my son. Every morning I would go out and do exercises for my stroke recovery. And I visualized my son healthy, happy, and successful. I did that for years, long before he moved in with me, because mm -hmm. he was struggling <clears throat> before then. And then I dropped the visualization. I figured that the universe now knew what I wanted. And it was clear, and I stopped visualizing. And then, lo and behold, a year or two later, he gets clean and sober. And I visualized the same thing. I wanted to meet my perfect partner, my, my ideal partner. Beautiful on the inside, beautiful on the outside, spiritual. And I, because I was single for years after the stroke. And so I visualized meeting her. I do, had this visualization in mind, formed this intention when I was doing my morning exercise, and then I would drop it. And then again, I finally dropped it all completely because I figured the universe knew what I wanted. And then a couple of years later, I was teaching a workshop here in Santa Barbara in uh, 2012, July 2012. I met her. I met this beautiful younger woman, Tanya. And we've been together now for th almost three years. And um, How much younger is she, if you don't mind my asking? 25 years younger. Wow. Yeah. yeah. She's, got, I'm, she's 43 and I'm 68. Mm -hmm. And we have a beautiful relationship. You know, we have our challenges, but uh, the love between us is so deep that it, ultimately love conquers all, right? Love heals all wounds. Love heals all challenges. That's nice. Uh, and this is a good point, I think, because, you know, visualization and all is a popular thing. And people put little post-it notes on the refrigerator and on their shaving mirror and so on. And there's that movie, The Secret. And But what you're saying, I think, is a, a kind of a refinement of that idea which would be good for people to understand which is that it's not enough to just have the desire or the intention or the wish uh, it's important to to entertain it from a much deeper level of awareness uh, you know from a, a liberated realized state it has much greater potency than if you just sort of entertain it from some agitated bound you know fear-based kind of condition um, it's kind of like, you know, you can think of the, well, physical creation, the, the, the physical level of this book has a certain weight to it, I could drop it, or something. Uh, the, the, the chemical or molecular level has, has more power latent in it, I could burn it and it would release a lot of energy. The atomic level could probably, you know, fuel the mm -hmm. entire United States for a year if we could release all that energy. So subtler levels are more powerful. And, and what you're suggesting is that, you know, having had this realization 20 years ago, now when you visualize something, it's from a, a deeper level and it has much, the arrow flies a lot further because you've pulled it back on the bow, you know. Um, and also I think dropping it is important uh, because, like you say, you know, the universe got the, the ideas. All, all right already, I know you need a partner. So like, <laughs> got the message, <laughs> like you could drop it, we'll take care of it. <laughs> That's beautifully said, Rick. Beautifully said. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself. That's the essence of my chapter seven, uh, creating a new story for your life. You have more power, you have more focus, you have more intention. You know, uh, Werner Earhart said back in the 70s, you get what you intend. Mm -hmm. 
So the, the power of intention is extremely uh, va valuable. And that's how we, you know, everything human made, from the tiniest microchip to the biggest jumbo jet and everything in between, came as born of an idea in someone's mind, yeah. their intention. So this is how to use the power of intention in a clean and clear and focused and very powerful way. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, the idea of dropping the, the intention once you have entertained it is harkens back to the Yoga Sutras where Patanjali talks about the process of sanyama, which is, you know, you have a, an intention and then you just let it kind of fall back into samadhi, fall back into the self. And, uh, you know, then the result comes forth. It's not through doggedly sort of hammering away at the intention, but by entertaining it and then just letting, and then just kind of transcending on it. Beautifully. Beautiful said. Yeah. Um, great. So we've gone through the chapters of this book, and now you've written a new one, or you're in the process. You, yes. Still, process. still writing. So still writing. Uh, want to give us a sneak peek about that one? Well, it's <clears throat> the working title is The Most Powerful Realization of All, mm -hmm. and it's really about... Um, the thing that you, the understanding that uh, clears your mind, opens your heart, and frees you from suffering. And it's the understanding that you're not your mind. You have a mind, but you're not your mind. You How does that differ than what you've been saying in this book? It's the same thing, but just a deeper, clearer, more way, uh, you know, just a more compelling way. Maybe, uh, maybe some people will be moved by uh, end your story, begin your life more. But. Um, yeah. I'm a writer. I started as a writer. I, you know, that's why I went to Vietnam. I wanted to be a novelist, by, uh, like Ernest Hemingway. Oh. And uh, I started out writing novels, and uh, and then I had this health crisis, and uh, which sent me on my spiritual path. And so I began writing books about man's search for meaning, which is, of course, my own search for meaning in life. Mm -hmm. So I've always been a writer. So what a writer does is write books, right? <laughs> Good. And writers tend to evolve as they go along and get better at it and, you know, go deeper into it and so on. So that's great. Keep right. It. If they, particularly if they're on the path of uh, awakening. Yeah, right. I mean, a lot of novelists, you know, like Ernest Hemingway, for example, uh, weren't on the path of awakening and he self-destructed. Yeah. Um, but those who were, you know, like the American transcendentalists and, and people like that, there's, there's always a, a new horizon and a sort of a, a deeper level that you can touch upon. Right. And, you know, speaking of new horizon, the more we awake we are, the freer we are of our, of our story, the more we live in the present here now, mm -hmm. and the more we realize that every moment is new. Every moment is new. Yeah. Good. Okay, so um, on a practical note, um, what are the various ways in which people can engage with you? Most of the people are going to be living far away from where you live. Uh, you mentioned Skype conversations. Um, you, you, you traveled to Australia and New Zealand, you said in my introduction. Um, if people are interested, but they happen to be living in Czechoslovakia or something like that, yeah. um, what should they do? Well, they should email me from my website and, uh, and then... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be doing an online satsang series sh starting shortly. Mm -hmm. So, um, like a live streaming kind of thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. It may be audio. I'd mean, like to do video, but I, I'm not sure w whether that will work better or not. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I, I'll do an online satsang, probably meeting once a week, and um, so people can get get onto that. And I'll, I'd like that to be a worldwide thing. Of course, it can be on the internet. Yeah. Great. So um, you'll announce that on your website, I presume? I will. I will. Okay. And um, do you have a, th a thing on your website where people can put in their email address and be notified of such things? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, plus, there's, there's uh, quite a few hours of YouTube videos and um, audios and videos on your website that people can listen to. Yes. And, yeah. and there's your book, and I'll be linking to that f and any other books you've written from your page on batgap.com. Um, I suppose that pretty much covers it, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, on your page on batgap.com, I'll link to... It's just jim, jimdreaver.com, D-R-E-A-V-E-R, -E -E yes. right? But I'll, right. I'll link to that in case, you know, somebody's driving their car and they forget what it is. Go, go there. And I'll also link to the Amazon pages of Jim's book. And uh, any, anything else in particular that we should announce before we get to more general things and conclude? Um... The, yeah, I, I, about covers I, it. Yeah, about covers it, Rick. I just want to say, 
You did a great job, brother. Well, yeah, thank you. Just, I love doing you, this. You're, you're doing a great job. I love doing it. Yeah. Like you were saying, you know, you kind of do what you love and that's what you're best at, you know, the thing, yeah, you, yeah, exactly. the thing you love. I also yeah. do, do, you know, I have a day job, but this is where I really kind of like my, all, all the cylinders start to fire. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see you. You're shining now. You're, you're radiating. Yeah, it really has that effect. I mean, I come out from these interviews and my wife says, wow, you look like you've been out jogging or something. You've got <laughs> color in your face. <laughs> really kind of wakes you up, especially talking to somebody like you. <clears throat> so let me just make a few concluding remarks. Uh, this obviously is part of an ongoing series, this interview. Um, there are about 280 of them now, and um, there will continue to be others. So if you'd like to be notified every time a new one is posted, go to batgap.com and sign up for the email notification thing. You can also subscribe on YouTube, and YouTube will notify you when a new video goes up. There's an audio podcast of this, so you can listen on your iPod or whatever. Um, there's a page which gives you the options for signing up for that. Um, there's a donate button, which we rely upon people clicking in order to be able to do this and continue to expand it. Um, there is, what else is there? Um, that's about it. Explore the menus on BatGap. The, the past interviews are archived in various ways. There's an announcement for the future interviews and so on, but poke around. There's not, it's not too complicated. You'll get it. So, so thanks a lot, Jim. Uh, really appreciate having had the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Next week, uh, is a, a, I'm going to do an interview with a local friend of mine who has a very interesting story. And the week after that is uh, Hamid Ali, or A.H. Almas, who... Oh, sure, I know him. Yeah. yeah, I'll be interviewing him for the second time next week. I really enjoy talking to him. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jim. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.